All right, very quickly this morning, we're going to go straight to the Word of God. We're talking about bouncing back from difficult times. I think this month has been amazing. Do you agree? Please, can you help me celebrate our senior pastor? Uh, is this how you celebrate your senior pastor? When it comes to emotional healing, you know, there is, Pastor Bonaji carries a grace. You know, and I have, you know, the other time I was having lunch with two ladies, and they were telling me how bad, how suicidal they were, and they used to cut themselves. And then now, they, are, they came, listened to his teaching, and now they are totally different people. The other one said to me that I used to take a go cigarette, you know, because there's really nothing left to live for. But she came to church and sat down under the teaching, and now she's doing mighty things for herself and for God. You know, because this story of changed lives is actually very true. Hallelujah. And I know that a lot of us, if I give you the microphones, you can testify to the fact that if you're here with us, there is no way your life will not be transformed. Yes or no? Hallelujah. So in, as we end the series this month, we're talking about bouncing back from difficult times. It's very important that we know that as Christians, we don't live a trouble-free life. I know, it's not such a good news. You know, the Bible says in John 16, verse 33, it says, in this life, in this very world, it said that you will have tribulation. Mm -hmm. It says that, but be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome. And then it says again in Psalm 34, verse 19, it says that many are the affliction of the righteous. It says, but what? But the Lord delivers it, them from all. And so the, the, the two familiar... Two similar things in those scripture is that number one, you and I will have problems. There will be unmet expectations. There will be failures. There will be disappointment. There will be pain. There will be betrayal. There will be, there will be all these things. It is true. It says that, but the other part of it, the flip part of it said, but, it says, I have overcome. It says, but, I will deliver you. And so I really do love the way God is honest with us, you know, in this conversation. So when you and I know that in this life there will be tribulation, we do what? We enter into the difficult times with some steadiness. Somebody say some steadiness. Hallelujah. And it's important to know that when we're going through these difficult times, you know, you're, you're in a bad marriage or you are, you're facing a terrible sickness or something, you're, you know, you're stagnated. It's important that you know that God has not forgotten you or God is not against you. Because the devil, you know, makes it look as if, ah, hey, maybe you are calling on the name of God. What then happened to you? It's important that we know that God is not against us. Hallelujah. You know, and I, I totally do understand the deep sense of loss and loneliness and, um, and pressure that comes with facing difficult times. And for Christians, the, the, it's, for non-Christians, rather, it's better for them because they can say that, oh, God is punishing them. But for we that we are Christians, it's harder. And then you're wondering that, God, when? When will this be over? You know, I'm facing all of these things, and God, why? Why is it even happening to me? You know, you're looking at 40s, and 40s looking at you, and your aunties are calling you and saying, when is the death? And you're wondering that, God, this pressure is actually getting too much. I totally do understand. And you know, very quickly, I want to share with you, I have had my pockets of depression. And um, one that really stood out was um, during COVID. I mean, COVID was just COVID. I lost a friend to suicide. She woke up in the morning, took her kids to school, got back home, took sniper, locked the doors properly so that nobody would gain, gain entrance took sniper, and then she died. I went for the funeral, and for some reason, that experience won't leave me. You know, and I really did stay with how she went about the last 10 minutes of her life. You know, and I kept dwelling on it and dwelling on it. And I came to a conclusion that life was nothing. So, you know, everything, if I, if I was supposed to maybe join a meeting, I'm like, what's the, what's the purpose? Life is nothing. And I feel like depression is not something that happens to you at once. I think it's something that you sink into. So I kept going on and going on. 
And so I wasn't really interested in business again. And my marriage had even gone upside down already. Because I wasn't just interested in the marriage. Everything around me. Why? Because I had come to a conclusion that life was nothing. And you know how depression is. If you have been depressed before, your mind begins to dictate to you. So I started to hallucinate. The things that were not real became real to me. My mind would be telling me that if you go outside, somebody will just hit you. I'm like, it's even good. I couldn't want that to go because life was nothing. So I kept on, kept on, kept on. And I didn't tell anybody. You know, but I knew that something was wrong. I wouldn't want to go outside. You know, if I feel the air on my face, I'll be very angry. If I wake up in the morning, I'll be like, oh, what kind of day with this day? You know, so I went on like that. One day I told my husband, I said to him, I said, babe, if anything happens to me, this person and this person is who I think you can marry. And then he looked at me and said, is everything okay? I said, yeah, but just remember that I told you. And I didn't tell anybody what, what I was going through, but I was just consistently, you know, I, don't even, I can't even explain how I became depressed, but bit by bit, I entered into a normal mood of not interested in anything. So one day, my friend, a friend of mine sent me a message, just normal, you know how people say, how are you? But they really want to move to something else. So I knew that it was that normal, how are you? But then I then replied to say, oh, I'm depressed. And then she's, she responded and I said, laughing out loud. Well, I imagine you laughing saying this because it's not something that, you know, you would think will happen to me. And then I didn't respond to her message. So she came the next day and took me out. She said, let's go out. I said, I, I don't used to go out. She said, ah, when did we go? What's this thing? Like? I said, I don't used to go out. I used to stay in my room. And in the room, it must be dark. No light. That was my comfort zone. And, but she dragged me and dragged me, and then we eventually went out. And as we spoke, light began to dawn. Hallelujah. And then bit by bit, I became better. Somebody said, praise the Lord. And so I know for a shorty what it is like. And if I give us the microphones, I know that a lot of us here, we have gone through our own pocket times of depression. And the devil, like he is the, the devil, he will paint the picture. He will make us feel as if what we are going through, you know, is peculiar for us alone. But yet, the Bible says that there is no temptation that is common to man. Hallelujah. So, how do we bounce back from difficult times? Somebody say, number one, recognize that there is help in God. You know, whilst that might sound like, okay, <clears throat> let me tell you a story I heard. There's a lady, she's Mexican. There, you know, there is a way that help is staring at you, and yet you're not maximizing the help. So she's Mexican at, the, I think, about the age of 22. She went to work for a white woman, an American. So she worked for her for 20 years. So this white woman, you know, died and then gave her the receipt of the will. Just gave her a paper that gives her the millions of dollars and everything that she had. Gave it to this woman. But she didn't even know what she had. All she knew was that this thing was a prized document that her madame gave her before she died. So she did what? She went to frame the document. And she framed it and put it in her room. So this was, her madame died when she was 44. So this is her at 72. And she was, you know, she had gone through, you know, hunger, different things. She had lived a very bad, terrible life not understanding that help was right in front of our bed. And that is, sometimes that is how we are. We are in the middle of help, but yet we don't recognize and access the help. So she then, you know, the doctor then came to see her, I think when she was 72. And then she was telling the doctors the good old days and about her, you know, her madame. And, you know, this is the thing, the only thing that she has left of the madame. And then the doctor looks at it and says, ah, ma, this is is the receipt of a will that gives you money. But she didn't know. So a few years after that, she did what? She died. She died a pauper, even though she had money. Can we turn our Bibles to Psalm 55, verse 22? Scripture says, Cast your body upon the Lord, and he will sustain thee. He says that he shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. 
It says what? Cast your burden upon the Lord. And what? In the exchange of your casting your body, what will he do? He will sustain thee and he, will, he shall not suffer you to be moved. The message version puts it in a way that I like. It says, pile your troubles on God's shoulders. Hallelujah. It says that trouble, that difficult situation, it says, pile it, say, fling it on God. Release it on God. You know, I says that, and the Lord, it says, he will carry your load. Hallelujah. I love God. He's a master carrier. He says that he will carry your load. He will help you out. He says he will never let good people tumble into ruin. Hallelujah. He says he will carry your load. He said one of the things that I specialize in as your God is to carry your load. And so sometimes it feels as if we are casting our burdens, but really we're not casting it. The person that casted their burden in the Bible that we know is Anna. The Bible says that she came to the altar, she casted the barrenness, and she left, and her countenance was changed. But sometimes we think that we've casted it, but then we cast it on Monday, on Tuesday, we pick it up again. And then we start to say, oh, this is my problem. Oh, this is my marriage. We didn't cast anything. We just talked about around the problem. Hallelujah. He says, cast your burden. He says, and trust God with your worries and your anxieties. He said, give it to him. And trust him with it. That's what it means to cast. Cast. You fling it on the altar. You give everything to God. You know, we, 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 like, to, we like to play God. We like to play as if we need help. But yet, we're, we're, we're dragging God. We're saying, God, you don't know how this thing hurts me. He's saying, let it go. You're saying, no, God. You know, this thing is really painful. He says, let it go so I can give you a new song. But you're saying, no, God. This thing is really hurting me. Well, he says that he wants to sustain you. And the only way that he can sustain you is to cast all your cares on him. He says that I am the one that is good at carrying load. He says, come on to me, all of us that are heavenly laden. He says, I will give you rest. Somebody say amen. amen. So no matter the disappointment, no matter the, you know, the pain, the betrayal, the failure, he says, I want to carry your load. I want to carry it. I want you to leave it for me to carry. I want you to totally hands off from that issue, that issue that is making you cry. He says, I want to help you. He says, pile it on my back. My shoulder is big enough to carry your load. He says, I want to carry your load. And then he says that as you cast, he says, I will sustain you. We we'll exchange the burdens for God's sustenance. And the Bible calls him our El Shaddai, the mortal breasted one, the one that can nurse you, sustain your finance, sustain your health, sustain your emotions. So why don't we want to cast it? Because we think that, you know, we're smarter than God. We can do it our way. No. You know, the Bible talks about Jesus. He said that when Jesus got to the gates of Gethsemane, he says that his soul was, was sorrowful. Jesus that need, that did not need to pray. He said, my soul was indeed sorrowful. He said, and he prayed. And as he prayed, the Bible says that angels came to minister to him. That is an exchange. Hallelujah. And so as we want to bounce back from these difficult times, there is a need for us to indeed and truly, in the real sense, cast it upon God. So tap your neighbor and say, cast your load upon God. When you cast it, you know how you will know? There will be a rest in your spirit. It says that be not anxious for anything. It says that bring your anxiety. I want to replace it with my peace. It says the peace of the Lord will mount guard over your heart. That's how you know. But if you're consistently thinking that that problem is your problem and you, for you to deal, then you haven't casted it. You've just prayed about it or talked to God about it. You're still carrying it. Hallelujah. You know how you know that you're casted it? When they ask you about it, you tell them, he says that he's getting sorted already. That's the language of someone that knows that there's things in the works. You say, oh, what about the delay? You say, oh, no, it's being worked on. Because you know that you've brought it to the altar. Hallelujah. He has not called the house of Jacob to seek him in vain. So what do we do? We do what? We cast it. That marriage issue, you cast it. That child issue, what? You cast it. And then the Lord will begin to sustain. The Lord will sustain you in the name of Jesus. 
Isaiah 43 verse 2, it talks about how God sustains. He says that when you walk through the water, he says, I will be there with you. He says that when you pass through the floor, he says, I will sustain you. He said, when you walk through the fire, the fire will not burn you. Why? Because I will sustain you. And Daniel understood this. Daniel and his friends. That's why they said, take us to the fire. Because they knew that there was a fourth man, a sustainer with them. They brought them out. The Bible says that the smoke did not even smell on their body. The sustainer. There is a God that wants to sustain you and I. But what we need to do is to do what? Cast it. He says, fling your problems on my shoulder. I can carry it. Hallelujah. The second way to bounce back from difficulties, recognize that there is gifts in men. Hallelujah. The Bible says that he led captivity captive and he did what? He gave gifts unto men. The man sitting next to you can be the solution to your problem. Hallelujah. So what do you do? In our church, we're very big on small groups and healthy communities. Find a place and connect yourself. Amen. So very quickly, the third thing, you know, how to bounce back from from difficult times is to be expectant. Somebody say be expectant. Can you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Proverbs 23, verse 18? It says that, For surely, Ayakuba da brada. It says, For surely there is an end. For surely there is an end. It says, And your expectation shall not be cut off. I thought somebody would shout a big amen. amen. It says, Surely there is an end. So what do we do? We expect. Why? Because expectation is the mother of miracles. If you want to give birth to miracles, what do you do? You stay expectant. I know that there, it's difficult and there might be hopelessness, you know, and all of that. But what do we do? We stay expectant. Because Paul was in a very, you know, wonderful situation. His ship was about to wreck. But he said to them, he said, I know that it will be even as it was told me. That is expectation. He was expectant. Without expectation, there can't be any intervention. Because it will be unto you as it was to, as, as you expect. It says that your expectation shall be met. And you know, your pastors can pray for you, but nobody can expect for you. Expectation is a personal thing. So your work is to ensure that you're constantly expecting. Single ladies, if you're expecting, you know, a man, the Bible says that you'll be well sought after. You're not in a hurry to leave church. You're waiting for them to collect your number. Hey, single ladies, are you in the house? The Bible says you are well sought after. So you're not in a hurry. I'm expecting somebody to collect my number. When you talk to an expectant pregnant woman, even though you can't see the baby, but she's making plans. That's what the expectation looks like. The approval has not come, but you begin to make plans. The wedding is not, is not come, but you're buying things on Amazon, making plans. Why? Because you're expectant. Expectation is the mother of miracles. There is an attitude that expectation brings. You know, there is an attitude with expectation. It brings to you an atmosphere that shifts things. It's almost as though there is a relationship between, you know, expectation and your desires. And so when you're not expecting, you know, your desires can really not be met. So when you wake up every week or we wake up every day, what exactly is it you're expecting that God should do? If you have zero expectation, brothers and sisters, you have, zero, you have nothing. Without expectation, you will be back in January 2024. You'll be back at January 2024. You'll be back in January 2023 as if nothing happened. And this is our year of what? Exploits. Hallelujah. So you have to be expectant. This is the year of laughter. You've got to be expecting because good things are around you. So you take it. You take it by expecting. That's how to bounce back from difficult times. You ensure that your expectation gauge is full. You expect that this week somebody will favor me. You expect it. So when the, when the favor comes, they say, yeah, I knew it was coming. Because what your expectation will magnetize that thing that you desire. <laughs> Hallelujah. He says that to him that believes there shall be a performance. He says that if you don't believe or expect, there will not be a performance. He says so mightily grew the word and he prevailed. So you're going to expect that concerning your marriage, the word of God will prevail. Concerning your approval, the word of God will prevail. This is your expectation. He says to them that believe there shall be a performance. 
We're expecting that there is a performance on that request. We're expecting, Lord, on this health issue, there is a performance. I'm expecting. So I consistently check. He said that when Elijah was expecting the rain, he kept checking people, go and check, go and check. You can't be expecting that you're not checking for something. Consistently checking. Hallelujah. So we're not hopeless. Somebody said we're not hopeless. We are full of hope. We're full of expectation. Because so mightily good the word concerning me, concerning my situation, and the word will word it will prevail. The word will word will manifest. The word will manifest concerning your issues in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that his word will not return to him void. These are the things that we expect. That that word of God concerning my child, concerning my marriage, concerning my finance, he will not return back to God void. He would, he would fulfill that which he has sent it for. So you're going to tell yourself, oh, today I'm expecting that the word of God will come to pass. You're going to tell yourself, Stanley, today I expect that the word of God will come to pass. Concerning me, it will come to pass. He said that he will not return to God void. He said he will accomplish. He will bring to pass. He would accomplish that which is sent for. And that will be your story in the name of Jesus. The third way to bounce back, stay grateful. You know, this is very, um, it's almost like, you know, everybody says it. But one time I was in a very difficult situation. And my pastor, my senior pastor, he taught me a way out. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18, I'm sure you know, it says in everything give thanks. In everything, not some things. And I know that you can tell me that, Pastor, I have lost a lot of money. Or, Pastor, I was engaged for seven years. Where will I start from? You know, you're saying to me that, you know, maybe you don't really understand what it is that I'm going through. So how is it that you tell me to be grateful? And my response to you is that really it can be worse. It could have been worse. Hallelujah. Because what the devil planned for you was destruction. My friend that had um, that committed suicide, she had marriage issues. A lot of people go through marriage issues, but you're standing today. The things that you're standing on has destroyed a lot of people. Because what the devil meant was to destroy you. That you're standing today is because of God. So what you do, you give thanks. So what did my senior pastor teach me? He says, you need to have a gratitude journal. He says, every day before you sleep, think of two things that God has done and write it down. When he said it to me, it seemed like very, something very simple because I went to him with this big problem and this is the simple thing that he said to me. But as I practiced it, my focus shifted. And that's the thing with gratitude. You know, I started to see, ah, God, you're actually really doing these things in my life. And it's not as if he wasn't doing it, but the Bible says that your faith shall become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that Christ is doing. And so as I began to you know, write down. I called him after two weeks. I said, he's working, he's working. He said, hey, what's working? I said, that thing that you said to me is working. Hallelujah. You can shift. You can move away from a difficult time by gratitude. Somebody say amen. amen. So what do you do? Stay grateful. Tap your neighbor. Say great. Stay grateful. Amen. Hallelujah. The fourth way to, to come out of difficult time is to inject joy. Somebody say Joy. Isaiah 12 verse 3. I love this. The Bible says, Therefore, with joy shall we draw water out of the wells of salvation. Joy is a choice. You know, growing up as a Christian, I thought that joy was something that, you know, was part of the Christian. No. But as I grew up, I'm still young. <laughs> I realized that joy is a choice. Joy is that tool that helps you to dispense a better state. And I looked at the life of Joseph. Joseph, even though he was betrayed, he was sold out, he was lied on, he was punished, everything about him. Never for once did I hear him lament or complain. Unlike Uncle David. You know Uncle David? <laughs> the lamenter. <laughs> Hallelujah. But Joseph, you know, kept his joy. He kept his joy to the extent that he was checking up on people. Who checks on people on people in the prison? He was checking up on them. He says, how are you doing? How are you feel? Ah, what happened to you today? You did not wear makeup. That was Joseph. He kept his joy. You know, please, can I have that thing? And so the Bible says that we joy, we draw from the well of salvation. 
you know, so this is, a, this is what I see in the picture. So this bucket, you guys, you know, for online people, you might not understand, but where we are from, we have well. You know well? Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Why is it as if you don't know well now? You know we're all coming from Akumonjo. <laughs> so this is joy. Somebody say joy. The Bible says that we joy, we do what? We draw from the well of salvation. So you bring a bucket. You know when you are going to fetch water now? You bring a bucket. So that bucket is the bucket of your life. You take it to the well of salvation. Hallelujah. You then take your joy. Hallelujah. So joy is a tool. You take the joy. You go and get the joy. Wherever the joy is, you go and get it. And then you say, we draw. You draw your joy. And then you feel, you hear, bokong. you know that noise? Good. And then you draw, you drop the, you drop the joy into the well of salvation. And you do what? You begin to fetch it out. You begin to fetch out whatever it is that you desire. Somebody say amen. amen. He says, and what is salvation? Salvation is that the things that God has saved us from. The Bible says that the chastisement of our peace was upon Jesus. So what does that mean? It means that there is peace in the well. In this well of salvation, somebody say amen. It says that because of you, I became poor so that you might be rich. So we know that in this well of salvation, what is there? Riches. It says that by your stripes, by your stripes we are healed. So what is in the well? It's healing. Hallelujah. It says that children are my inheritance. So what is in the well? Children. Hallelujah. It says that I came that you might have life and have it abundance. What is in this well? It's children. Good life. Hallelujah. It says that I have not given you the spirit of fear, but the spirit of love and of sound mind. So what is in this well? Love and sound mind. So what do you do? You draw. You draw. You want good life, you draw. You want healing, you draw. You want peace of mind, you draw out of the well of salvation. Joy is a tool. You use it. Nothing has to happen. You're just joyful. You just choose to be joyful. Why? Because with joy, you can draw that that you desire out of the well of salvation. Hallelujah. I want us to quick, very quickly look at the scripture. In Psalms 5 verse 11. You know, sometimes I get home. Or, you know, I notice that my marriage, there's a lot of tension. A lot of fight. A lot of misunderstanding. I usually get home before my husband. So as I about to climb the staircase, I look at the wall and I declare, I said, over this home, I speak joy and peace. I'm not joking. And it works like magic. All of a sudden, he, our countenance was that of we're fighting, we're fighting. But once we come upstairs together, I just feel that there's a peace that settles. So you do what? With joy, you declare with your mouth. You go over your business. You say, I declare joy over this business. You look at your body. You declare joy over this body. Hallelujah. And you know, when Jesus was coming, one of the most significant things that happened was that the angel looked at the shepherd and said, hey, 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 Joy to the world. The Lord has come. The angel looked and said, It is now time for light and salvation. He says, Joy to the world. Joy is not something that we joke with. We ensure that nothing takes our joy. We keep our joy intact. We protect it. It says, guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it flows the issues of life. Somebody say amen. amen. So Psalms 5 verse 11. It says, but let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. He said, let them over. Let them ever shout for joy. I thought somebody would shout for joy. He says that if you put your trust in God, he said rejoice. If you know that your trust for the future is in God, the trust that that thing that is said to you is in God, can you rejoice? You're going to rejoice by shouting hallelujah because in this kingdom, this is our language. He says shout for joy. He says shout for joy. Oh, you it. Can you shout hallelujah? He says... Because thou defended them. He said, let them also that have, 
that love my name, be joyful in thee. He says, the Lord defends you. He says, he will fight for you and you will hold your peace. He says, I defend you. And so we rejoice because we know that the Lord is on the matter. He's fighting our case. So what do we do? He said, rejoice. He said, shout for joy because the Lord is defending us. And as I close this morning, I want us to look at Psalm 30, 30 verse 5. The Bible says that for his anger endured for a moment. In his favor is life. This is where I'm going to. He said, weeping may endure for a night. But what? But joy cometh in the morning. My understanding of this scripture is that joy is synonymous to morning. So if I'm in my night time and I want joy and I want the morning to break forth, what do I do? I bring joy. I'm not sure you heard me. He says, weeping may enjoy for the night. He said, but joy, it comes in the morning. So when I want my morning to break forth, I do what I get joy and I juxtapose it within dark. He says, joy, it comes in the morning. He says, joy, it comes in the morning. So now I know what to do when I'm in my difficult time. I sit down in my seat. I put another chair and I begin to shout for joy. Nothing has happened, but I know that God is working on it. Hallelujah. The Bible says, shout joyfully. Shout joyfully unto the Lord. And you know, for us in the kingdom, shouting is... Um... <laughs> Hallelujah. Shouting is, shouting is a code. You don't understand. It's a reference to... When the children of Israel went around the walls of Jericho, the Bible says that they should shout. We don't know the correlation between the wall and the shouting, but we know that victory came. And so we can reference that as a Lord. If the children of Israel shouted for joy and the victory came, I can shout and have the victory. Why? Because for us, we've seen God do it before. And you know, the funny thing is that he says that shout for joy, O ye barren. I mean, the Lord says some things that you cannot, but because he works, what do we do? We shout for joy. Whether we're barren of ideas or barren of children, he says shout for joy because many are your fruits. So there is a correlation between shouting and victory. So we keep shouting. We keep shouting. We shout until we have our desires. We shout until God makes a way. We shout until all the doors are open. We shout until there is joy on our inside. And the Bible says, The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. strength. Can we rise up as we pray? The joy of the Lord is our strength. So you keep shouting. And the strength rises up on your inside like a flood. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Oh, Father, we thank you. We are no longer quiet people. We are joyful. We are joyful people. Every day we shout of joy in our homes, over our businesses, over our desires. We shout for joy in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. This morning, we're going to do something a bit different. If you're going through a difficult time, I want you to put your hand on your chest. And I want them, someone next to you, because we are all preached unto God. I want you to say a word of prayer in agreement with that person. Can we? If you're going through a tough time, there is healing in the house this morning. There is salvation. From the well of salvation, we have come to draw joy. And so if you're going through a time that you feel like, Lord, how, when, when will this thing come through? I want you to put your hand on your chest and our pastors can go around and begin to minister to them. Anamakoshi katara manashte. Onakashte kela bradokoshi dabayanda. 
Yes, there is joy. Joy overflowing. Yes, yes, yes. Strength, strength is being ministered in the name of Jesus. Concerning you, it will come to pass as it was spoken in the name of Jesus. In this year of exploits, in this year of laughter, you will sing a new song. You will laugh your laugh in the name of Jesus. Where there has been pain, Lord, we speak the peace of God. Where has been strife, we speak the peace of the Lord. Where has been difficulties, we speak the ease of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, Allah take a Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And the angels of the Lord. I ate the brokodosta. I sent you for my neck Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Make whole. Make whole. Amen. Make whole. Strengthen. I let the brokodosta. Make whole. Lord, make whole. Strengthen. In the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, we thank you, Lord. Yes. And the Lord began to make whole today. Yes, that's what I hear in my spirit. And the Lord began to make whole today, 28th of May, 2023. And the Lord began to make whole. Yes, whole, whole. From inside outward, whole. Everything about you, whole. Father, we thank you. We receive your word. You're making whole. You're filling the gap. Your ministry, oh God, you are mending, you are strengthening, you are folding, you are elevating, you are lifting, Lord. Oh, Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And if you're here, you don't know Christ the way we're talking about him. You can't really connect. This is your moment. This is your time. All heads bow. If you can, just lift up your hand. And the public sign that you are certain Jesus. If you're online, you can put your name there. Can you say these words with me? Heavenly Father, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. I denounce the works of the devil. I believe with my heart that you died and was raised from the dead for my justification. And I declare boldly that I am born again, now and forever, in the name of Jesus, in Jesus' mighty name. And if you said that prayer, I pray for you this morning, that you begin to encounter God in a new way. In the name of Jesus, you come to know, not just know about God, but you come to know of God. You come to know him as a father. That the Lord, the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened to see God and the hope of his calling. We give you all the praise, everlasting Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.